My name is Nicholas Carey. Um, I was born to a French mother, so uh, I can relate to everyone's experience here. My father lives in South America. My sister has been in Africa the past two years, and I have traveled about 350,000 miles in the past 12 months, uh, lecturing, speaking about Bitcoin, uh, meeting with legal and governmental affair bodies, and uh, basically doing advocacy work um, as much as possible. And on the side, I run Blockchain, which is the world's most widely used Bitcoin company. Um, we have three category leading services. So we build wallets to let people secure, send and receive, and transact Bitcoin. We have about 3.5 million users. We have a search engine that lets people go study transactions that are happening on the Bitcoin network. And at the core of our business is a developer platform that lets software engineers, wherever they are, build really cool applications for the Bitcoin blockchain. So I'm going to take you through today. There are probably some experts in Bitcoin up here, but also in the audience. But before you can really kind of understand why this is such an interesting innovation, it's super important to understand the fundamentals about it. So let's just take a quick moment to build some context. Imagine a world with completely frictionless payments. A world where you can send value from a fly fishing lodge in Patagonia instantly all the way across the world to Singapore, basically for free. Imagine a world where you had a global payments network, a payments platform with zero barriers to entry, where anyone, regardless of where they were born or what color their skin is or what their gender is, could choose to participate. It's voluntary. So that's what Bitcoin is just at a very, very high level. It's a global payments network, and it kind of possesses three things. It has a currency, it has the ability to settle transactions with a high degree of certainty, and you can do this anywhere in the world. It's a network for the age of the internet. So I'm gonna discuss a couple things which are the basics of Bitcoin. I want to go through the history, which is kind of interesting, and it's still sort of evolving. Finally, the economics of Bitcoin, which are very interesting and very debatable. <laughs> and then some charts and trends. Uh, we can talk about where we've come from in just a few short years. So, at the most basic level, Bitcoin is a technology. It's also a computer protocol. We use protocols in the devices that we have in our pockets every single day. Most people in here send emails to their friends and loved ones, and that relies on something called TCP IP, which, relies, which lets your phone send messages to a network of servers all over the world and instantly deliver, deliver email wherever you are to anyone you want to. So just like there's a global messaging service, essentially, Bitcoin is a financial protocol for the internet. And uh, we've been in desperate need of this. It's also a huge network. It's the world's largest distributed computing project on Earth. And so uh, basically, if you were to take the world's 500 most powerful supercomputers, it would not be more powerful than Bitcoin. So what does it kind of look like? This is an abstraction. Essentially, people can choose to download a piece of software and run it on their computer. Now, you kind of need specialized equipment to do this now, but you can still experiment with it, and that makes you a node on the network. And for participating in the network, if you uh, basically lend your computing power to update the transactions that are happening, you're rewarded every 10 minutes or so with tiny fees and small amounts of Bitcoin. So it's participatory. So, you have the three basics of a transaction network. A currency, a trusted ledger to settle the transaction chain of who owns what, and fundamentally, settlement with a high degree of certainty. And these are requirements in order to have a global payment network. So <clears throat> oftentimes, Bitcoin is confused with many things. I would say nine out of 10 people a year ago had never heard about Bitcoin. And now nine out of 10 people have probably heard the wrong things, but that's okay because it means we're making some progress, I think. Um, but Bitcoin is not a company, it is not illegal, um, it's not centrally controlled, it's not proprietary, it's entirely open source, and uh, it's not bound by jurisdictions the way we think of other types of applications. Um, it's entirely a global phenomenon. So the photography you'll see in this presentation, by the way, was taken over the past year um, as I traveled around the world. So fundamentally, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer payment network. We use peer-to-peer -peer technology a lot, we just don't always know it. Skype, for example, was based on peer-to-peer -peer telephony, and voice over IP completely changed the way we talk on phones, and we don't even realize it. Bitcoin will do the same thing for money. So when a transaction is made, it is instantly broadcasted to something called the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, I'll have a demonstration of this in a minute, but basically transactions are sent between wallets, between people to exchanges, and soon between machines. So what does it look like? Well, you have a Bitcoin wallet, which you can download and install on your phone, 
In 30 seconds, you basically put an application that is free, that's open source, onto your smartphone that completely replaces all of your banking needs. And uh, you can then give someone a Bitcoin address. Just like if I wanted to send Eric an email, he would need to give me an email address. If I wanted to send Eric some Bitcoin, he would show me a Bitcoin address. It's like a public routing number to his wallet. So when that transaction is made, it broadcasts a transaction to a giant network all over the world, and you can visit the uh, blockchain.info, and you can see the transactions streaming in real time. To give you a sense for the scope of this, we're doing about $300 million worth of transactions a week. And uh, two or three years ago, when that study came out, there were maybe 2,000 or 3,000 transactions a day on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now there are over 100,000 every single day. So you have to look at the overall speed at which things are happening and the trajectory. But it shouldn't be a big surprise. Sending Bitcoin from one place to another is the most efficient way in the world to send value right now. If I wanted to uh, send these chairs to New York City, it would be faster to FedEx them than to wire money there right now. But using Bitcoin, I can do it instantly. So let's talk a little bit about the history. It's only a five or six year old experiment. It was introduced conceptually as a white paper by a group of developers, or a developer, we're not really sure, um, that launched as a network in 2009. In 2010, some basic marketplaces formed and people were discussing Bitcoin, but the people that were doing this were cryptographers and computer scientists, really, really nerdy people. Um, in 2011, there was some angel investment in the space, and uh, at that point, more and more people started to pay a bit of attention to it. In 2012, merchants all over the world started to accept Bitcoin. And this is sort of curious. Usually, consumer adoption sort of beats out merchant adoption. In Bitcoin, it's happening at about the same rate, and there's a really good reason. When you go buy a cup of coffee or you pay for something at a small store, Every time you make a transaction with your card, there's a base fee, and then the merchant eats a 2 to 3% cost on every transaction, just to accept a form of payment and just to give you goods that you want. And actually, these have costs for consumers. If you don't think that we're at some point eating those costs, you're absolutely wrong. Um, so merchants started accepting Bitcoin because when they take a Bitcoin payment, they get 100% of the transaction. It's just like handing somebody euros or dollars or yen, except it happens digitally. Now, what you do with those is up to you. You can go sell them, or you can keep them and spend them again, creating hopefully a virtuous economy. So in 2013, there was a huge surge in startups in the industry. Last year, $650 million of venture capital poured into Bitcoin companies. That is an absurd amount of money. Um, it is more money that went into the early internet to go into these projects. And they're going into Bitcoin and blockchain type projects because there's an incredible opportunity in this industry. I'll talk a little bit about that. The economics are really kind of interesting. We spend our entire lives in pursuit of money, or some of the students here will probably start to do that soon, paying off student debts like I had to. And we don't always think a whole lot about where money comes from and what creates value. They print paper bills and they put people's pictures on them and we're believed that this is supposed to be tender, that we can be able to redeem for goods and services. And every single year, we hope that that'll be the case next year. What happens, though, is that more and more money gets printed every single year through things like quantitative easing. Central banks just print incredible amounts of money. Well, Bitcoin has a very, very different approach. It's a fixed inflation schedule. We know exactly how much money is going to come into circulation, so it's predictable. This is very different. So basically, coins are going to be released on that uh, curve. Every four years, there are fewer of them. Some people ask, why did so many come into circulation at the beginning? Well, the idea was to incentivize the transaction velocity. If more people have them, then they'll share them. Um, the network is maintained, again, by volunteers who lend their computing power and energy to secure the transactions. Basically, what that means is they keep track of a database, and for doing that, they're rewarded with small fees. Um, so the whole thing is regulated by mathematics. There are no politicians involved. All the rules were written when the network was launched, and that's the way it is. There is a software update process, so you can make updates to the Bitcoin protocol, and that requires consensus from all the members of the network. It's pretty cool. So let's think for a minute. We as human beings have invented all kinds of things in our lives. We invented wheels so that we could drive around. We invented shovels so we could dig holes, and then tractors so that we could build roads, right? We do things to create more efficiencies. Why can't we create a better form of money well, let's think about it. For the age of the internet, what kind of properties would you want a money to have? You might want your money to be easily uh, able to divide and recombine. It, you would want your money to be impossible to counterfeit. You want your money to be durable. 
Paper money is sort of ridiculous. If you wash it, it gets destroyed, it can burn in a fire. Um, how about money that you could instantly redeem on any smartphone with a secret passphrase? So even if you chuck your phone into the Sen or, uh, or have an accident with it or drop it, you don't lose your money. All those things are possible. In the age of the internet, you'd really want to be able to send that money anywhere in the world instantly, basically for free, allowing you to create relationships which essentially almost all human interactions at some point fundamentally come down to transacting. If you can bring everyone into the sphere of economic influence of the internet, then you're onto something very powerful. Well, Bitcoin does that too. And for the first time, Bitcoin is the only transaction network with something that has zero counterparty risk. So right now, if I have a deal with Eric and he provides some consulting services to me and I ask for a payment, let's say I take a credit card payment, well, I, he could issue a chargeback. So he could do the work and then get his money back. That's kind of a problem. And because of all these types of intermediaries, whether it's credit card companies, merchant processors, banks, there's tons of friction in every transaction that happens. And that doesn't need to be the case. Peer-to-peer -peer transactions are much more frictionless and therefore have lower costs and are basically better for everyone on both sides. So I submit that if you were to design a currency, Bitcoin would be an interesting experiment for the age of the internet. Is it perfect? Probably not. But there are going to be many, many other experiments in this industry as well. So um, where are we today? Um, this is some high-level information. The overall network is worth about $3.35 billion. So this is actually not that big. Um, a skyscraper in London is more valuable than the entire Bitcoin network right now. So just to put things in context, we have a lot of work to do. But that's the transaction volume. You'll hear people talk about the price of Bitcoin and what, the, what that is today because it's a currency and it has value. That's not that interesting to me. What's interesting to me is whether or not people are moving it around. So um, that study that was conducted a few years ago happened when you can see very, very, basically there's very small transaction volume. Week over week, <clears throat> we're hitting records. So that means more and more people are starting to adopt and use Bitcoin to send value. So I find the, the uh, most interesting metric is just basically transaction volume. So, so what? Why are people all over the world talking about this? Why is Goldman Sachs and BBVA and NASDAQ and most of the venture capital firms in the world, Richard Branson and others, put money into Bitcoin projects? Microsoft, Dell, Overstock, OKCupid, WordPress, Wikipedia, all accept Bitcoin as forms of donation and for payment. They're doing it because it's the world's first, first scarce digital commodity. They can accept the payment with zero counterparty risk. They get 100% of the payment. There's no fraud. And uh, basically, it allows them to send value anywhere in the world instantly, basically for free. So at its core, here's kind of where we are. Um, when the protocol was launched, the people that were building that were software programmers and cryptographers and developers. And they're still doing that. They're volunteers to participate and basically maintain the core code base. There was a wave of builders. These were sort of the, uh, the early startups in the industry building things like exchanges and wallets, consumer services, merchant services, mining services, and more. These are sort of the new verticals of future finance. And then uh, the next wave of innovation, which we'll hear about soon. Oops, sorry. <laughs> the next wave of innovation we'll hear about soon um, will be all kinds of really fascinating applications. If you take out an intermediary between a transaction, money is just the first experiment. What if I could get rid of all kinds of other intermediaries? How many people get really sick of waiting in line to get pieces of paper stamped and notary services? It's crazy. These are relics of ancient times, and we don't need to use them anymore. Um, this solves all kinds of wild ideas like property rights, uh, global governance, voting services with certainty that what you decided was actually shown. Um, we'll look at some of those examples soon. So, this is the, the investment landscape. Um, basically, there's been a huge amount of money poured into this. If you think that Bitcoin is sketchy, maybe that's uh, something that uh, you should reevaluate. The companies that are accepting Bitcoin have hundreds of billions of dollars of market capitalization. They don't do things when there's reputational risk. They make investments and votes of confidence when there's really interesting things happening. So there's been a massive amount of movement in this industry. It's still going very quickly, and you will see more and more names added to this list over the next 12 months and coming years. So <clears throat> with Bitcoin, it doesn't matter where you were from. It doesn't matter whether you were born in the first world or the third world, whether you're a mother sending college money to your daughter or a father sending wages back home to your family across the border. This is the most important innovation since the internet. And the reason is because people have financial independence to transact with whoever they want without somebody telling them what they can and can't do. And it's a really big deal. 
Um, I want to talk just quickly before I hand this over, and we'll be excited to have conversations about any questions you have. Um, but there's a story I want to share real quick. And uh, basically, when I was in Morocco um, last year with my sister, we went out into the desert, and uh, we had a Berber guide that was taking us um, into the dunes. And we hadn't seen an electrical system or any sort of sign of civilization uh, for a while. And uh, we're watching the sunset. It was absolutely beautiful. And in that moment, the whole thing was ruined when our guide, who sells rocks and polished geodes for a living, pulls out his iPhone 5 and answers his phone in the middle of the desert. And that guy has access now to a financial service and a financial network that is more efficient than hedge fund managers and more efficient than the ones that Fortune 500 CEOs have access to. So think about that for a minute. If you can put software on someone's phone that replaces banking functions, it's a really big deal. Um, five weeks ago, Goldman Sachs, uh, the largest investment bank in the world, released a report that said that 33% of millennials do not expect to have a bank account in five years. So if millennials don't expect to have a bank account in five years, and there are 2.5 billion people that don't have bank accounts whatsoever, and there are 4 billion people with no credit cards, how are they going to get their financial and banking services in the future? Well, I submit that Bitcoin and blockchain type services and software are going to solve a lot of these problems. So anyway, let's open this up for discussion. Bitcoin is not perfect. I will submit that, and uh, I'm sure we'll hear some really interesting arguments for why, and then I'll counter those to the best of my ability. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Español, English, Deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produciere ich nur videos en English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ja, algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now, already some weeks ago, I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I'm sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten uh, finanziell helfen kann. 
y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und Motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my fir the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, e explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgenden. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, And the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. O maybe a tip in a restaurant. O da trinkgeld en un restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin. De direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, uh, 
um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin Adressen druckt, auch die, äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln, ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, escribir la fecha, más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener, tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. In mein Video an diesen Englisch, Español. Video Mix Nummer 25, Video Mix Nummer 25. This time I want to talk especially about hashtag JCCVW, which I created some time ago, abbreviation for Justice, Court, Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Esta vez Quiero hablar especialmente sobre el tema hashtag JCCVW, que el hashtag que he creado hace algún tiempo so, que, eh, y es la abreviación por eh, justicia, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, eh, justicia, comedia de justicia en mundos virtuales. I made already several videos about this hashtag. Uh, ya he hecho varios videos sobre este hashtag. But this time especially thinking 
of my last video number 24 uh, robot ethics pero esta vez especialmente pensando en mi último video uh, video mix número 24 robot ethics e ética de robots First, I want to mention uh, the episode of Simpsons Treehouse of Horror number 13. Primero quiero men mencionar el, el, epi el episodio de Simpsons número 13, Treehouse of Horror número 13. Just a side note, it's uh, astonishing uh, now many years and Spanish TV uh, and at lunchtime and in the evening they are still showing about half an hour or more uh, Simpsons, many years now. Es asombroso. Um, ya muchos años que por el mediodía y también por la, por la noche enseñan por lo menos media hora de los Simpsons in uh, television Española. Did you hear of the term Simpsonology? Has oído de, del término Simpsonología? Oh, Simpson, Simpson, Simpsonology. Simpson, Simpsonology. Maybe I'll check out if it in Spanish. Simpsonología. Todavía no. Long story short, the moral of the this episode of The Simpsons. The animals have more ethics than humans. Resumiendo este episodio de Los Simpsons, uh, los animales tienen más ética que los humanos. Remember my last video number Video mix number 24, Robot Ethics, Cat Ethics. Recuerda mi uh, último video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, Ética de Robots and Cat Ethics, Ética de Gatos. And with a funny gif. GIF is abbreviation for graphic interchange format. Y con un gracioso GIF. GIF. Maybe it's a little bit help helpful to compare robot ethics and cat ethics. Tal vez uh, ayuda a comparar un poco el ética de robots y ética de gatos. Once I said to my mom, uh, talking with this person is like uh, teaching, teaching ethics to cats. Una vez he dicho a mi madre, mira, hablando con esta persona es como uh, enseñar ética a, a gatos. They just do what they want. Solo sim simplemente hacen lo que quieren. And the robots do what they are programmed to do. Y los robots hacen simplemente lo que están programados de hacer. The question is the responsibility. La cuestión es la responsabilidad. So in the end, you see, it's almost not controllable. Así que verás que al final no es controlable. But normal cats can never turn as evil as humans. Pero gatos normales nunca pueden volverse tan eh, malos, hacer cosas tan malas como los humanos. Perversion, perversión, opposite land, el país de justo todo al revés. Copyright, copy prohibition. 
El copyright es más bien no un derecho de copiar, sino una prohibición de copia, copiar. Law of intellectual property, la ley de la propiedad intelectual. Especially because I like to produce video mix, I got very angry about the legal system and the perverse law of intellectual property which inhibits innovation and freedom of expression. Especialmente porque me gusta producir video mix. Uh, me Enfadé con el sistema legal, en especialmente, el, especialmente la ley de la propiedad intelectual que inhibe la innovación y la libertad de expresión. And if you continue to think about the legal system, uh, you more and more doubts. Y si continúas de pensar sobre el sistema legal, vas a tener más y más dudas. But still, you have, I think it's important to have a place to talk about ethics. Pero igualmente pienso que es importante de tener un lugar donde se hable sobre ética. That's the main motivation why I created hashtag JCCVW, Justice Card Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Es la motivación principal por la que he creado el hashtag JCCVW, just Justice Court, Comedy in Virtual Worlds, Justicia, Comedia de Justicia en Mundos Virtuales. Even on my main Twitter account, Manos Enigma, the cover picture, um, I've got written Justice, who has the right to judge, who is without sin, cast the first stone. Hasta en mi cuenta de Twitter principal, Vanos Enigma, tengo um, el cover, um, la imagen de cover, escrito justicia. ¿Quién tiene el derecho de juzgar? ¿Quién está sin pecado que tire la primera piedra? And it's astonishing how often the Simpsons show some kind of court comedies. Y es asombroso cuántas veces en los Simpsons enseñan algún tipo de comedias de juicios. I want to remember especially the lawsuit or court comedy of Homer Simpson when he sold his soul to the devil, Ned Flanders. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Homer Simpson cuando vendió su alma al diablo, uh, Ned Flanders. En el sistema legal, system, the question is always, is it legal or is it illegal? En el sistema legal, eh, normalmente la cuestión is is legal or is illegal but it's more important to ask is it, is it ethical is it right or is it wrong es más importante preguntar es está bien o mal es ético o es, no no es ético did you hear of the term jury nullification Has oído de este término, ahora no sé en español, pero eh, uno tiene el derecho de decir que, por ejemplo, no culpable porque la ley es injusta. 
you have the right to say it's uh, not guilty because the law is not just in just. I want to remember especially the case of Ross Albrecht, Free Ross, hashtag Free Ross, Dread Pirate, Silk Road. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road, Bitcoin, and my profile picture of Innocent Crypto Kitty y mi imagen de perfil Innocent Crypto Kitty que quiere decir el, el gatito inocente de criptografía. But it's medical catnip. Pero es catnip medico. 30 years of jail for running a website which other people used for buying and selling catnip. 30 años de cárcel por hacer una página web que otras personas han usado para comprar y vender catnip. And I want to remember what said Roger Ware, uh, Bitcoin Jesus. He said something like, uh, the war against drugs cause more harm than the drugs themselves. Y quiero recordar lo que dijo Roger Ware, que es como el Bitcoin, el Jesús de Bitcoin. Dijo algo como que la guerra contra las drogas causan más daño que las drogas mismas. Okay, let's go back to even if you would have want to have a person like ah and not just Roger Ware, uh, the case of Charlie Shrin, another Bitcoiner. A very interesting case too and one interview um, I made a video um, very interesting comment of Andreas Antonopoulos in one episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin I think it's the video mix number Yes, I had just a look. It's video mix number 17. Uh, justo he mirado es el video mix número 17 uh, con Charlie Shrem. Uh, this comment I like too much, so I will paste it. I'll just paste it here. Este comentario me gusta demasiado, así que uh, algunos minutos voy a pegar. Este momento. And, uh, podcast can agree to the fact that whatever we have in this country that passes for a justice system has at least three tiers. There are, you know, uh, people at the top who get infinite, infinite forgiveness for some of the most disgusting mega crimes and never face the tiniest consequence for their actions. You can put a million people out of their homes with fraudulent foreclosures. And you'll never see the inside of a courtroom. You can rig markets, steal money from investors, defraud millions of people. You'll never see the inside of a courtroom. And yet... There's the other side of the scale where you have a situation of zero tolerance, where the slightest infraction, selling a loose cigarette for 30 cents, gets you a street side arrest judgment and execution by strangulation, where jaywalking gets you shot by a cop, even if you're unarmed, and where cities run effectively debtors' prisons where they rotate people through there for traffic fines and keep accumulating them until they end up in jail, 
for violating subpoenas and things like that and run it as a for-profit enterprise. And then in the middle is the middle class caught in this justice system, this thin layer that's getting thinner all the time because they're getting squeezed from the bottom. And the middle class sees the top of this country getting away with uh, mega crimes and sees a wave of zero tolerance coming at them that used to only affect minorities, but now is increasingly taking bites out of the middle class. And they're struggling desperately not to fall into this Orwellian zero tolerance justice system. That's not justice. I think everyone on this call probably has a similar perspective to this, but effectively what we're talking about is an erosion of the rule of law. And the most fundamental concept of the rule of law is equality in judgment. If a law exists, there is one tier. Everybody faces the same consequences for breaking that law. And that fundamental social compact has been violated. And for some stratum of the society, it never really existed. You know, Some people were always going to feel the heavy boot of law um, with no recourse and um, suffered under that for 200 years. Uh, but now that is increasingly becoming the vast majority of the population. So you live in a society where the slightest mistake is very harshly punished. That's if you survive the police encounter. Um, while you watch a country's so-called elite just roll from scandal to scandal, from crime to crime with no one going to jail. War crimes, no jail time. Bank fraud, no jail time. All of these things, you know, surveillance and violating the constitutional rights of millions of people, not even a misdemeanor issue. It just gets legalized after the fact. Lying to Congress, no problem. And then Preet can promote his resume by going after Charlie. It's really a disgusting situation, but I think it's it's a situation that has nothing to do with Bitcoin per se. It's just a universal collapse of justice and the rule of law in this country. One of the few countries that actually had it. As that was so well said, I have no response to it. I, I completely agree with Andreas, everything he just said. It's 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 not limited to, to Bitcoin. It's a, it's an overall you see it you see it with everything. I mean look at the case of Aaron Schwartz. May he rest in peace, but once they have their sights on you, telling it's you per se, I think it's what you represent or who you are. Um, there's no getting out of those sites. And the higher up you are, the harder it is for them to prosecute you. It just doesn't make sense for them. Our justice system has been corrupted or viewed to, to, to what it is today. And I created a hashtag, let's talk justice, or maybe a better hashtag, let's talk ethics. I también he creado ese hashtag, vamos a hablar sobre justicia, let's talk justice, pero tal vez mejor, let's talk ethics, vamos a hablar sobre ética. After this part of video mix number 17, I will paste a short video comparison of the two uh, websites of Wikipedia about this episode of Simpson Treehouse of Horror number 13. Y después de esa parte del video mix número 17 voy a pegar un pequeño video en una comparación entre las dos páginas de Wikipedia en inglés 
in Espanol, I forgot to say in English, in comparison between English and Spanish of the episode of The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, eh, perdón, Espanol ahora, eh, comparación del episodio de Simpson Treehouse of Horror número 13. Comparing hashtag JCCVW to uh, the real legal system, of course, there is no such thing like judgment, rather a uh, fiction punishment. Comparando JCCVW, uh, comparándolo con el sistema legal, uh, por supuesto no hay tal cosa como un, una sentencia de juicio, más bien un, un castigo ficticio. Just want to remember you, I have that uh, Twitter account Soul Trade game in virtual worlds like Second Life with, with Virtual Guide Dog. Uh, recordar que tengo la cuenta en Twitter que se llama Soul Trade Game, traducido Juego de Negocios de Almas. Es como un juego en mundos virtuales como Second Life. Especially interesting for cats and blind people. Especialmente interesante para gatos y personas que estén ciegos o tengan problemas con los ojos. O people blind o people who have problems with the eyes. The bra. Anyway, watch my videos about Soul Trade Game. De todas formas, mirad mis videos sobre Soul Trade Game, juego de negocio de almas. And I have that Twitter account, Soul, uh, sorry, Soul Confiscator Catch. Y tengo este, esta cuenta de Twitter, Soul Confiscator Catch. You are welcome on all of my Twitter accounts. Normally I follow back. Estáis bienvenidos en todas mis cuentas de Twitter. Normalmente sigo de vuelta. So you see I have a double or triple interest to open hashtag JCCVW. Así que... Veis que tengo un doble o triple interés de abrir el hashtag JCCVW Justice Club Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Uh, what I wanted to say before about the jury nullification. Uh, if you really would like to, to um, participate in a trial lawsuit uh, to help uh, somebody from getting declared guilty fast. You have to take vacation. You have to buy a flight to New York. And I think this trial was in January of um, Free Ross Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road. So, bueno, lo que iba a decir antes uh, con respecto al derecho de uh, renalification, en español no me acuerdo, so, no estoy segura, pero que tienes el derecho de decir que mira, yo estoy, uh, no estoy de acuerdo que esta persona sea declarada culpable. Oh, así que primero tendrías que tomar vacaciones, comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y eh, era ese juicio me parece era en, en enero cuando hizo un montón de frío. So comparing this legal system 
with uh, hashtag JCCVW. This is in, in, in virtual worlds. Everybody can participate and talk about ethics, right or wrong. Don't need to buy a flight to New York. Uh, comparando ahí con el sistema legal. No, eso tiene que tiene lugar en mundos virtuales, no hay que comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y tanto, tanto esfuerzo para participar en un juicio, discutir sobre ética, puedes fácilmente participar de cualquier lugar, ordenador, P2P, and especially talking about robot ethics this will be very important in the future y especialmente el tema de ética de robots en el futuro será muy importante because it's easy to say that the person who programmed the robot is responsible for the actions but uh, it's very easy to uh, to hide the identity who programmed the robot. Es muy fácil decir que la persona que ha programado el robot es responsable por las acciones del robot, pero es muy fácil de ocultar la identidad de la persona que ha programado el robot. So now I